Coming up... The Guardian of Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The voice of a nation heard around the world. They had to hear the truth. Plus... You just submit, and that's what I did. He lived a nightmare. That's it, man, I'm gonna fight back. And woke up under a bridge. I was done. Life had become that miserable. His transformation. The freedom that came from simply loving. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, he told President Trump a monstrous lie. He said, Palestinians teach their children peace. Well, the Palestinian culture and its media tell a very different story. They sure do. Palestinians often openly honor terrorists who have killed Israelis. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jerusalem. This is what Mahmoud Abbas told President Trump in the White House on May 3rd. But this is what you can hear their children say on Palestinian television. There is no greater lie than Mahmoud Abbas saying that they're teaching their children to have peace. They demonize Israelis and Jews in every which way possible. Itamar Marcus of Palestinian Media Watch says that not only are their children taught to hate Jews, but the theme of celebrating deadly violence against Israel also extends into Palestinian culture. The Palestinian Authority named schools, town squares, and even sporting events after Palestinians who kill Israelis. One street in Ramallah is named after Ahmed Yassin, the founder of Hamas. Another street bears the name of Yahya Ayash, named the engineer for developing Palestinian suicide bombs. And one square is named after Abu Sukar, the man known as the refrigerator bomber. What did he do to make himself famous? He took a bomb, he took a refrigerator, brought it to Ben Yehuda Street in the center of Jerusalem, uh, filled it with explosives, and it detonated, killing 15 Israelis. So that makes him a Palestinian hero, and there's a square in his name. Basically, anyone who's killed a large number of, Palest of Israelis is presented by the Palestinian leadership as a hero to their people. Mm. As President Trump plans to meet again with Abbas during his visit to the Middle East in a few weeks, Marcus doesn't think Trump is aware of what goes on inside the Palestinian Authority. It's urgent that they get the proper message because otherwise they'll be pushing uh, for something that would be a disaster for Israel. We must have a peace process, but you must have educational peace process before we can even begin talking about a political peace process. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. That's a story you're not going to hear on other news outlets, but we want to tell you the real story of what's going on inside the Palestinian Authority, what they're teaching their children, what they have in their schools. Here's a culture that stores rockets in their schools. Um, that is, it's just unimaginable. They create their targets, use their children as shields. Uh, they, 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 it, it, it's truly unbelievable. Here's another fact. They pay the terrorists and their families a monthly salary. It's called the Pay for Slay program. And Mahmoud Abbas is the architect of that program. 30% of all the foreign aid to the Palestinian Authority goes to pay terrorists. And the monthly amount that's being paid increases based on the severity of crimes against Israelis. Uh, if you're an American citizen like me, it's your tax dollars funding that. Uh, and to have him sit in the White House and say, uh, we teach peace and we're a culture of peace, uh, no, it's a monstrous lie and we need to wake up to it. Uh, we're funding this and it needs to stop. Well, in other news, some Democrats are still pushing for an independent counsel to investigate the Russian activities in last year's election. But so far, Republicans aren't going along with it. 
John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. Well, that call for an independent counsel was just one of the developments at a Senate intelligence hearing. The committee's leading Democrat also told the acting FBI director that if he experiences any political influence from the White House in an attempt to quash the agency's investigation into Russian meddling, that he should let the committee know. Eric Rosales has that story from Capitol Hill. Speaking at a hearing on worldwide threats, Andrew McCabe sat in the hot seat as acting director of the FBI. McCabe is occupying the seat that earlier this week belonged to James Comey. Has the dismissal of Mr. Comey in any way impeded any of the work at the Federal Bureau of Investigations? There has been no effort to impede our investigation to date. Quite simply put, sir, you cannot stop the men and women of the FBI from doing the right thing protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution. Under oath, McCabe was also asked if the rank and file had lost confidence with James Comey as FBI director. He said that assertion from the White House was not accurate. I can tell you that I hold Director Comey in the absolute highest regard. I have the highest respect for his considerable abilities and his integrity, and it has been the greatest privilege and honor of my professional life to work with him. President Trump's actions this week cost us an opportunity to get at the truth, at least for today. Virginia Senator Mark Warner used the hearing to lash out at the commander in chief. He and others then questioned McCabe about what he knows and what he heard, specifically between the former FBI director and President Trump. Did you ever hear Director Comey tell the president he was not the subject of an investigation? Sir, I can't comment. Uh, on any conversations the director may have had with the president. When did you last meet with the president, Director McCabe? I don't think I, um, I don't think I'm um, Was it in a position to this comment week? on that. Uh, I have uh, met with the president this week, but I don't and, really want to go into the okay. details of that. But Ru Russia did not come up. That's correct. It okay. did not. Senators reiterated calls to appoint an independent special counsel to get to the bottom of what occurred during the 2016 U.S. presidential election. President Trump fired back Thursday saying he planned to fire FBI Director James B. Comey regardless of the recommendations of his deputy attorney general and others in the Justice Department. It's unclear how long McCabe will serve as acting director. He joined the FBI in 1994 and became deputy director in 2016. No doubt this latest assignment is the biggest in his career. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Eric Rosales, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. No people of faith face greater hostility anywhere in the world today than Christians. That was the message from Vice President Mike Pence at the first ever World Summit in defense of persecuted Christians this week right here in Washington, brought together by evangelist Franklin Graham. More than 600 believers from 130 nations came to the event. Paul Strand brings us that story. More than 200 million Christians in some 50 nations are facing high, very high, or even extreme persecution. Just about every month, more than 300 are killed for their faith. Persecuted Christians often feel isolated and alone. Franklin Graham called this summit to let them know the church stands in solidarity with them, and it's working on solutions to fight that persecution. The presence of the U.S. Vice President showed the attacks are getting attention at the highest levels. How deeply humbling it is for me to stand today before the courageous men and women who are with us, who have stood without apology for their faith in Christ and suffered persecution across the wider world. Because being captured on camera at such a summit could cause them further trouble back home, those actually facing persecution preferred telling their stories behind closed doors. But Graham warned believers here in the U.S. are also starting to face discrimination, such as homosexual attacks on Christian businesses. We have seen businesses uh, put out of business, attacked, targeted, uh, and then the gay activists come in and liberal judges uh, in those states uh, support the, the, these decisions. And we see businesses now afraid, Christians are afraid uh, that they'll be attacked. Pence assured those facing persecution and discrimination, this nation won't forget them. You have the prayers of the American people, prayers of my family, and you have the prayers of the President of the United States. And I appreciate that uh, President Trump has kept his word. And he's going to do that, uh, not just on religious liberty, but I think he's going to do this in fighting ISIS and defeating the enemies of the cross. Franklin Graham hopes that church leaders return to their homes encouraged and ready to stand faithful for the gospel 
no matter what they face. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Paul. Gordon, so much to learn from our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the things to learn is to uphold them in prayer. I was at that conference in Washington and the, the cry continually from those who are being persecuted in the Middle East is when will the United States wake up? Uh, it's almost like we want to have willful blindness. In our last administration, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was called a social welfare organization. Uh, when 21 uh, Coptic Christians were murdered on a beach in Libya, uh, they were called contract workers. It wasn't identified as to what was really going on, uh, that they were being killed for their Christian faith. And at the end of that slaughter, the leader of that group uh, pointed a knife across the Mediterranean and said, by Allah's will, uh, we will do this in Rome. We need to wake up to the threat that's facing Christianity worldwide. Uh, there's a genocide going on in the Middle East, and it's specifically targeted at Christians. Wendy? Coming up, he was a military champion who provided a calm voice in the face of annihilation. The impact his broadcast had on the national morale is reminiscent of the impact that Churchill's broadcast had on uh, British morale during World War II, and that was very significant. The sons of Israeli General Haim Herzog remember their father's legacy. Next. In the spring of 1967, Israel is facing threats of invasion from every direction, and Western allies turn their backs on the Jewish state. In Israel's darkest hour, a voice of calm was heard over the airwaves. John Wagi brings us that story from Jerusalem. By the end of May 1967, the die was cast. Israel would soon be at war on all borders. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol tried to reassure the nation, but he was ill and faltered during his address. Military General Chaim Herzog stepped in to fill the gap with radio commentary in Hebrew and English. A new page has been opened in the history of our people's battles and of the courage of Israel. And deep in the heart of each and every one of us at this moment, when we think of those engaged in, us in the struggle, there is, irrespective of whether we normally pray or not, a prayer that the guardian of Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. During the Six-Day War, Chaim Herzog didn't just calm the nation. He became Israel's first military ruler over Judea and Samaria in more than 2,000 years. He was also a powerful presence as UN ambassador and later as president of Israel. Chaim Herzog died in 1997, but his legacy lives on. His son Isaac is now chairman of Israel's leading opposition party, the Zionist Union. He was only seven when the war broke out. Still, he remembers the prevailing fear. What we know is that there was a period of awaiting about three weeks before the war, where the national mood was Auschwitz. Israel is going to its second holocaust, whoever leaves last should turn off the light and leave the country. That was the mood. Isaac's older brother Michael, now a retired major general, was 15 at the time. He says there's no doubt Israelis were concerned about the nation's survival. So I still remember ourselves, uh, like many other people in Israel, digging trench in our backyard because we expected that we would be shelled, and we were shelled. Tel Aviv was shelled by the Jordanians during the Six-Day War. Young people who have abandoned the cafes of Dizengoff Street and the discotheque the farm boys, the yeshiva students, the members of the youth movements, the boys of the immigrant townships, all are at this moment shoulder to shoulder fighting in the air, on the land and on the sea for our right simply to live. You know what's interesting is we hear a lot today about the term fake news and that kind of thing. 67 was a banner year for fake news, especially in Egypt and, and in Syria, and your father was kind of counteracting that to a people that didn't know really what was happening. They had to hear the truth. We would hear what was called Kol Kahir, Voice of Cairo, 
and they would speak in Hebrew, and they would say the worst things. We're going to throw you to the sea. I guess you yeah, heard yeah, it. Yeah, they said all. terrible things, and people were on, there was anxiety. But he provided very professional analysis. He, he first of all, he knew the situation. I am broadcasting from Jerusalem to the sound of heavy shelling. A strange form of quiet and anticipation has fallen along the front line. A quiet that may foretell great tidings. He would broadcast three times a day. He would also broadcast in English, so there were both BBC and others, but the three times a day you'd walk in the streets of Tel Aviv and you'd hear his voice throughout the city, people just listening, stopping and listening. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. I heard his voice in the trench. I heard my dad, we, you know, my mom brought a little radio and we would hear him in the trench and he calmed us down. I was told by soldiers then uh, in, in the front lines and they would listen to him and I was told by quite a few of them that uh, this really boosted their morale before going into battle. Just one day into the war, Israel's Air Force virtually destroyed the capacity of Egypt, Syria and Jordan to strike from the air. On the ground, Israel's army penetrated deep into the Sinai and pushed toward Jordan on the West Bank. By day three, Chaim Herzog could tell the nation the unthinkable. After two millennia, Jerusalem was back in Jewish hands. The miracle of our generation continues, as does the brilliant campaign, the like of which there is no record of in the history of Israel, and perhaps in the history of the nations and which has achieved today what millions of Jews throughout the generations have prayed for. We live in a very different era than 1967, but in my mind, uh, what our father, the impact his broadcast had on the national morale is reminiscent of the impact that Churchill's broadcast had on uh, British morale during World War II, and that was very significant. And indeed, the saying goes, Jerusalem is a gift of the whole land of Israel. On the altar of the Temple Mount and Mount Moriah, the people of Israel offered up today priceless sacrifices which swell the toll of sacrifice by earlier generations. Our victory was not lightly achieved, and at this moment it is well that we remember those who offered up their lives for the glory of the Almighty and the nation. Today, both Herzogs are strong supporters of a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians, despite growing skepticism about the peace process among many Israelis. The hope is that 2017 can be a year of breakthrough. There is a golden opportunity in the region whereby you just need to stretch your hand and under American support, especially, I believe, from the White House, there could be a sea change in the region, Israel being recognized by all its neighbors, and we need to sit down and get to the difficult moment of trying to make peace. This is what we owe to the casualties who fell in the war, who are so brave in very difficult battles, and to the fact that we want the Jewish nation to live in peace and strength in the region while celebrating that great victory. John Waggy, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, CBN is putting out a movie marking the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War. It's called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. And the title comes from the remarkable radio broadcast from the leader of the 55th Paratrooper Brigade. The Temple Mount is in our hands. Now, it's one night only, it's May 23rd, and if you want to see it and get informed of the real history of the battle for Jerusalem in 1967, just go to inourhands1967.com. May 23rd is Jerusalem Reunification Day on the Jewish calendar. On our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, it's going to be celebrated on June 7. But on the Jewish calendar, it's May 23, and that's why we've chosen to release the movie on that date. And if you want tickets, all you have to do is go to that website, type in your zip code. You'll find a theater near you. Uh, if you want to bring a group, and I encourage you to bring a group because it will start a conversation, uh, both about the role of Israel in the world today, the threats it continues uh, to face today, as well as the role of biblical prophecy and how prophecy was fulfilled, the specific prophecy of Jesus, that Jerusalem will be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles 
until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that happened in my lifetime in 1967. And we need to teach a whole new generation the significance of that war, the significance of a unified Jerusalem, one that will never be broken up again. So go to the movie and go to the website, inourhands1967.com. Wendy? And what's so fascinating is those radio broadcasts sound like they could have just happened yesterday. That was 50 years ago. And, and also the footage, that, those are, that's the real footage from 1967. And yeah. um, you know, so we're very fortunate that we ha were able to draw on such um, those archives in you know, 50 years. We, we, we have the archives. The movie's based on the diaries of the soldiers who, who participated, actual interviews with the survivors of the 55th Paratrooper Brigade. And if you want to hear more of those radio broadcasts, we're going to have it online for you. Uh, we have the entire set. The, uh, the Sons have, have given us the ability to, to get those digitally, and so we have the entire set. So if you want to listen to history as it was being told at the time, mm. uh, just it's going to be on the website. It's also going to be at CBNnews.com. All right, it's fascinating. Well, up next, a sixth grader who was sent to juvie, and for him, that was a lot better than being at home. I could take care of myself with kids being locked up my age, but you know, at home, it wasn't like that, so I just felt safe being locked up. Hear why he says he now has a real family when we come back. Calvin Wooden was systematically abused throughout his childhood. This trauma haunted him well into his adult years. Calvin spent his days in and out of prison running from his pain until the day he woke up under a bridge and realized he couldn't run any longer. I heard a guy say one time that anger is fear under pressure. When I was growing up, fear was prevalent in my life growing up in the, in the way that I did with the sexual abuse and all the domestic violence and you know you, you get used to it and that's the thing and, it, and then it starts driving your life without you even really knowing you know you start structuring your life around around that fear. Calvin Wooten's childhood nightmares often came at the hands of his own family members. I remember it being overwhelming you know to the point where I would try to stay outside so much you know until I absolutely had to come in the house. I was just too little to fight back. You just don't fight when you're, when you're six, you just submit, and that's what I did. When a school principal threatened to paddle him for misbehavior in sixth grade, something in Calvin snapped. The day before, I was, I was raped, and then I was beaten shortly after that. And uh, I went to school, uh, you know, like everything was normal. That's how it was in, in, in when I grew up. But something was happening inside of me, and I went into what I believe was an anger blackout. But I grabbed the rails and kicked him to the bottom of the steps and, uh, and I followed him down and I just kind of started stomping on him. I left the school that day and, and, and it said in my head, that's it, you know, that's it, man, I'm gonna fight back. Calvin was sent to juvenile detention for a year, but says it was still better than being at home. I could take care of myself with, with kids being locked up my age, but you know, at home, it wasn't like that. So I just felt so safe being locked up. Once released, he turned to drugs to further escape his home life. Calvin also broke into houses to support his habit. The first time I smoked uh, marijuana, it was like, poof, man, my problems went away. And I was, I don't know that I was able to function normally, but I was able to function without the, the anxiety and the fear, you know, that was so prevalent. While the drugs relaxed him, alcohol fueled his anger. Any time I, I wanted to do something to somebody in a violent way, I always drank on it, always. You know, I knew that if I drank, then it was game on. His addiction escalated to cocaine and meth. For years, he was in and out of jail and left two broken families in his wake. Really, I, it wasn't just two failed marriages. It was every relationship I've ever had has failed. You know, I just, uh, I was a violent person to every woman I was ever with. I was that way with my kids. You know, I, I mean, I just, the anger that I carried was, it didn't discriminate. Calvin continued his downward spiral, stealing over $10,000 worth of construction equipment and selling it for drug money. When he woke up from his binge, he was under an interstate bridge. I was done. Life had become that miserable. But in the end, it wasn't what was done to me, it was what I had done to people. 
and I, and I couldn't escape the guilt and shame of, of what I had done. I wanted to stop hurting people. He learned that the Healing Place, a faith-based rehab facility, would give him a place to sleep. I climb in my bunk, and man, I just start crying. The only words I could utter was, God, please help me. And, uh, and he did. And God showed up in my life that day in the form of a whisper. And, and what he said to me is, Calvin, I love you. And I don't care about what you've done. I care about what you're going to do. And that was it for me. I mean, I, up to that point in my life, I don't think I'd recognized anything that would resemble love. Calvin surrendered his life to Christ and woke up the next morning a free man. I slept better that night than I had slept in years. But I didn't go to bed thinking about using, and I didn't wake up that way. And I knew when I woke up that next day that God had taken that, He had taken it. But I also knew that there was work to be done. Deliberate of his addiction and his anger, Calvin continued to grow in his faith. He completed rehab and was able to forgive the family members who abused him. I finally got to a spot where I knew in my heart that I could say that I loved the men that molested me. And so much changed in that, in that moment. And this may sound kind of crazy, but all my life I never wanted to be me. As a kid, I always imagined myself being someone else. But on the day that I realized I loved the men that had molested me, I've never ever wanted to be anybody but Calvin Wooten since that day. If you really dig into, into that message that Christ is pouring out there about love, it, it opens the door for forgiveness and it stays open. So I learned to love them out of the love for them. I, I just intuitively forgave them. And that was big for me, the freedom that came from simply loving. Today, he runs the Love Transformation Project, a ministry to the homeless in Louisville, Kentucky. And for the first time in his life, Calvin has a real family. I feel like the, the guys under the bridge is our family. You know, the kids we minister to in the parks are now our family. I never felt like I had a father, never felt like I had brothers and sisters. And I remember one night I got on my knees and I said, God, please, will you adopt me? And I, I know that's a crazy prayer for a grown man, but, but I felt God say, it's done. And I, and I felt the love of a father in a way that I had never felt. And something that wasn't gonna hurt me, but would, would inevitably protect me. I don't think there's been a time in my life since that day that I've not felt that sense of family. And you can have that same sense, that same sense that you belong, that you're protected, that you're safe. Maybe you've been abused. Maybe things were done to you that were unspeakable. And maybe you acted out just like Calvin acted out. But know this, if you respond with anger, if you respond with revenge, all you're doing is fueling it. The very thing you think you're fighting against, you're just fueling it. And if you hold on to that resentment, you hold on to that anger, uh, you plot out that revenge, if you hold on to these things, uh, it's, it's destructive to your own physical being. It, it never works. But what Calvin found worked. He found love. He found acceptance. I love what God told him. God shows up with that still, small voice. He'll show up with that whisper for you. And he'll say to you, I love you. I love you right where you are, who you are right now. But then it'll add to it. And I love you so much, I don't want to leave you here. I don't want to leave you in this. I want to change you and change you from your innermost being. For Calvin, it started with he no longer had a compulsion for drugs, for alcohol. And then it grew. And over time, love took over. And he was actually able to forgive the people who had abused him. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you let them keep doing it to you. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is you are now set free from guilt, from shame, from revenge, from that anger that eats away at you. And you're set free to live and to love. If you want this, it's real easy. Do the same thing that Calvin did. Bow your head and say, God, would you adopt me? 
would you take me into your family? And if you pray that with all of your heart, he'll hear and he'll answer. The Bible says when you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. So if you want this, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus do all the rest. What he did for Calvin, he'll do for you. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, just say his name. Say it out loud, Jesus. I come to you. You know what has happened to me. You know what I have done. And Jesus, right now, I ask that you adopt me, that you take me into your family, that you cleanse me and forgive me of the things that I've done wrong, that you take this hate out of my heart and make me new again. And Jesus, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in your name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. Fill them to overflowing with your love, your forgiveness, and your acceptance. Let them know today that they, their prayer has been heard and has been answered. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, I've got something free for you. It's a free packet. There's no financial obligation at all. Numbers toll free. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. 1-800-700-7000. The packet's called A New Day. In there's a CD teaching. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? Uh, what are the next steps to take? And if there's something that's really burdening your soul, we're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. You don't have to leave your name, anything like that. All you have to do is say, I've got this. Can, can God forgive me of this? And the answer is, yes, he can. There is no sin that can't be forgiven. Call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Gordon. Still ahead, a boy who was thought to be cursed and later bullied into dropping out of school. Hear how he got a new life. That's next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Fresno City Council has approved adding the national motto in God We Trust to the wall behind the dais inside City Council chamber. That is according to the Fresno Bee. Councilman Gary Bredefield said he was inspired by a national movement that started in 2002 and decided to add the phrase. He said that for too long, a silent majority has allowed a vocal minority to silence them. An overflow crowd of several hundred people packed the chamber with people speaking out on both sides. The newspaper reports the vast majority, though, favored the motto. The resolution says no taxpayer money will be used to add the words to the wall. Operation Blessing is spreading some much needed medical care to remote communities in Liberia. Families there are at high risk of illness and disease. Children and their families are growing sick from poor hygiene and disease carrying mosquitoes, with the nearest hospital sometimes being miles away. But thanks to Operation Blessing, community health workers are being trained to detect and treat the illnesses early. And they're writing referrals to encourage community members to go to the hospital a lot sooner. Now fewer people are sick and they're benefiting from having community workers just a few feet away. You can always learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, that is ob.org. Gordon and Wendy are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Chana was teased by his classmates and abandoned by his parents. He often wondered if he was treated poorly because of a sin he committed. The truth was, Chana 
hadn't done anything wrong. He was just born with a cleft lip. Chana's parents told him that he had to stay with his grandparents while they looked for a way to pay for his cleft lip surgery, but they never returned. He always asks us, what sin did I commit? Will you ever be able to get my surgery done? Chana's grandfather couldn't afford to pay for the surgery, but what hurt him the most was when Chana dropped out of school because of the constant teasing. When I went to school, the kids kept calling me monkey face. They would say, if you touch us, we will also become like you. Then, a neighbor whose son was given a free cleft lip surgery by CBN told us about Chana. We gave Chana the good news that he would also get a free operation. Not long after the surgery, we visited Chana and found out that he had returned to school. Now I'm very happy. I look normal like all the other kids. It feels good knowing that he is doing well in school. CBN also wanted to help Chana's grandparents make a better income, so we gave them some goats. We will breed and multiply the goats. I will be able to provide for my family and buy my grandson new clothes, books, and anything else he needs for school. You gave me a free surgery for my lip and my grandparents the goats. Thank you very much. Today, you can be the answer to someone's prayer. You can change a life like you did for little Chana. You know, he was not a happy little guy. And, and look now, he's going to enjoy life. He's got a hope and a future. And you can do that. How do you do that? You just join the 700 Club. Just 65 cents a day, $20 a month is all it takes to become a CBN partner. The number's on your screen, or you can log on to CBN.com. We want to give you something when you join. Uh, it's Pat Robertson's new DVD called Miracles. You can experience God's power for yourself. The stories on here are incredible. Incredible. They will, your faith will soar when you see what God did for others. He can do for you. This will encourage your faith. If you need a miracle, you need to see this. This is our gift to you when you give us a call right now and just say yes. Again, just 65 cents a day, $20 a month to join the 700 Club. Well, still ahead, um, a Jewish businessman takes a journey inside the book of Psalms and reveals how its words can help us communicate with God. Well, Reuben Ibrahimov says most of the Holy Scriptures contain God's words to man. The Psalms, on the other hand, are man's words to God. It contains more than 2,000 verses of man's deepest pain and praise. And Reuben says every one of them holds an eternal message. When businessman Reuben Ibrahimov began speaking in his synagogue about biblical prophets, he realized many people knew little or nothing about them. Audiences loved his insights, so he committed to share his interpretations with over 100 synagogues around the world. Now Ruben's YouTube videos reach thousands weekly. In his book, From Your Lips to God's Ears, Ruben offers his 10-step guide to understanding the Psalms for Jewish and non-Jewish homes. Well, Ruben is with us here now, and welcome to the 700 Club. I have to say, you, when you were first introduced to me, I've never had an introduction like this. Here is the world's foremost expert on the Psalms. Why have the Psalms become, I mean, it's like your life's work. Why? There is no book that I feel is more pervasive than the book of Psalms. On a daily basis, Jewish and Christian people are reading the book of Psalms. They use it to feel connected to God and when people hit bottom, they use it to raise themselves up to connect to God. Mm -hmm. I found in studying the book that we can use King David as a spiritual role model for us. And that is why I took such great interest in understanding the book. Many people read the book, but you need to understand these 10 different things about each chapter that will take you from reading it to understanding it. And the more you understand, the better you feel right. about it. And I would add to that, to not just to understand it, but to begin to pray it. 
that you will find a psalm for literally every human need and just start praying that psalm. You, you know it's the proper way to pray. Actually, about a thousand years ago, there was a great man named Chai Gaon, and he identified 150 outcomes of saying a particular psalm and that he sought out each sentence in each one of the Psalms, for example, where King David prayed for success in a threatening situation, that we too can reach out to God praying for that success in our own lives. And the book outlines all 150 chapters, reasons to say them. You say that we've lost the soul of the Psalms. What do you mean by that? I think what happens is that we look at Psalms, possibly within Judaism, and the prayer book as a stenographer's notes as what to went on in the temple time. You had the Kohen, the priests, doing the sacrificial work, mm -hmm. and the Levim, the Levites, were part of the Levitical orchestra, and that orchestra played music that would pass the cerebral cortex and go right into the emotion, and that that is the reason why I try to explain within the book of Psalms that it was originally sung and music played in the times of worship. And that I hope that will trickle down to people today to feel that energy of joy and happiness and connectivity. Is that why there are specific instructions, you know, how to play the particular in instruments on each one? Uh, and, and even some have a musical notation. It'll give you what should be the melody for it. And, and is there any way to recreate any of that? Is that? Or is that just lost? It used to be thought of lost. In my research, I stumbled across an extraordinary man named Dennis McCorkle. And Dennis is also passionate about the book of Psalms. And what he set out to do is to find out what the music of the temple sounded like. And he came up with what he called the Davidic cipher. Mm -hmm. And what he was able to do is, number one, learn Hebrew. Then he learned the musical cantillations, which typically is the vocalization. And he applied this theory that the vocalization, the notes, was also the instrumentation. And today, you could listen to what Dennis McCorkle's hypothesis is about what did the music in the time of the temple sound like. Wow. Amazing. That is amazing. I've got to ask this, well, what's your favorite song? I would have to go with the most popular one, which is the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. However, what I would like to share with you is the word hallelujah. Mm. And normally we say praise God. However, it was also an invocation. And I would say, Gordon, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then you would respond, you know something? I'm glad you asked me because I do have something very grateful, something to be very grateful for. Mm -hmm. Whatever the person's story may be, I had a child this week, my child uh, is healthy, I was successful. So that, whenever I see hallelujah, the last word in the book of Psalms, I remember that it's the opportunity to acknowledge God as being the source of all blessing. And it's curious that today uh, psychologists are finding that an attitude where you're, you're grateful uh, and you're expressing gratitude uh, to God actually leads to greater happiness. The more you remember the blessings, uh, the happier you get. Much, well, go ahead. So much of what we perceive is self-fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is if we're stressed out, we're worried, we're depressed, our focus snowballs in that direction. It's then time to pause, and it's time to ask ourselves, what do I have to be grateful for? And that using the book of Psalms, it will make us cognizant of those things that God is the source of the blessing and that we're actually blessed in an abundance. And whatever we're worried about usually is a small percentage. Fear behaves irrationally mm -hmm. in the brain.
And if we put it proportionately, we could manage our way through things. Well, I could talk to Ruben for a long time, but here, let me give you this. Uh, this book is absolutely incredible. It's called From Your Lips to God's Ears. My study of Psalms began with Spurgeon, the Treasury of David, and then I went to the Art Scroll two volume set of Psalms. I recommend both of those, but this one gives you not just the um, interpretation of them and the background of them. It also gives you all these wonderful musical notations, what kinds of instruments were available, how it would have been part of the service at the temple, and how it's part of the season, um, because the Israelites would read through the Psalms every year, and that was part of the weekly Torah portion, the weekly reading, and they would do it daily. Uh, and I encourage you, understand how the Psalms can inform your prayers, and you can get it with this book, From Your Lips to God's Ears, and it's available nationwide. And Reuben, thanks for being with us, and thanks for this wonderful book. Appreciate You're welcome, you. Gordon. All right. Thank you. Well, still ahead, we'll be answering questions from you, our viewers, so don't go away. Welcome back to the 700 Club. It is time to bring it on with your email questions. And Gordon looks ready. John writes in, we often hear that God will open doors no man can shut. But how do you know if a door is being opened or closed because of God and not just your own persistence or fear? Well, doors generally don't open because of fear. Uh, doors open supernaturally. And when you have that supernatural evidence that it's not based on your effort, um, but it's based solely on him, uh, then yay. But let me add to that. Uh, who gave you persistence? Who gave you intelligence? Who gave you the ability to do anything? Uh, realize all of that comes from God. Here are the words of John the Baptist. A man can receive nothing unless God gives it to him from heaven. And when you live your life under the recognition that all of you, all that what you have uh, comes from him, he is the author of everything, uh, you'll live a life of gratitude and you'll start to recognize all the wonderful things that God is doing for you. Good reminder there. All right, this viewer writes in, why do Catholics call Mary the mother of God, not the mother of Jesus? Uh, there's a long history on this one. Theotokos is the Greek word, and, uh, and it's saying because Jesus is equal with God, is part of the Trinity, and she is the mother of Jesus, that she is the mother of God. That's where that comes from, and that's the meaning. It's not saying that Mary is the mother of God the Father. He had no beginning, uh, and he, he is an uncreated being. Uh, and that's, that's the history of that doctrine. All right, here's another one. Jan says, I have pictures of Christ Jesus with his shining holy sacred heart and halo in my home, one framed on the wall and one on a desk. Are these considered idolatry? What do people of Christian and Jewish faith believe is appropriate? Uh, if you're Jewish, yes, that's idolatry. There's a specific commandment uh, in the Torah to have no images and no images of God that when God appeared to Moses in a burning bush, there was no image. And God specifically reminds Moses of that and create no image. Within the Christian church, uh, the debate over icons has been there for centuries. And at various points in time, people who were viewing icons and statues and even uh, stained glass windows as idolatrous uh, have risen up, and then the counter has always been, uh, well, these things are teaching tools, uh, and people aren't reading the Bible, but we can look at these images and find the truth of the story. It reminds us of the story. Um, so that's, again, the history of it. Um, let your conscience be the guide as to which way you wish to go. We leave you with a scripture from John. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For Wendy, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again next week.